This is number four in my new Patreon series on the pre-Christian teachings of Yeshua. We're looking at the Lord's Prayer because it contains all kinds of keys to the Kabbalistic mysticism of Yeshua's teachings. Now we're going to look at the phrase, Hallowed be thy name. For this I am using slides from a previous presentation that I had put up on YouTube, but I'm putting it in this form for Patreon so that people can understand the concept as it works with the other concepts in the Lord's Prayer. Now we know in the Lord's Prayer, in the Prayer of Yeshua, that at the very beginning he adds the section, Hallowed be thy name, is the way we translate it. Well, what is that name? What does that mean? Is that the tetragrammaton, yod He vav He that was given to Moses at the burning bush? The word that cannot be pronounced, uh, that may be translated, I am, I am, or I am that I am, or because I am, or I shall be to you what or who I shall be to you. Is it the tetragrammaton that was intoned by the high priest on the Day of Atonement, that was used magically and for theurgical purposes in Solomonic magic, or that was passed on to certain enlightened rabbis in the medieval period who became known each one as a Baal Shem Tov, a lord of the good name. And the pronouncing of that name could uh, cause the world to end. In the medieval Kabbalah and Solomonic magic, the Tetragrammaton was permutated into 72 angelic names by simply taking the Yod, He, Vav, and permutating them. That was known as the Shem Ham Forash, and that was used for magical purposes. It was used for theurgical and goetic work. And the name of God was disassociated from prophetic, moral, and ethical values that were taught by Yeshua. And that was, again, not halakha, which is what Yeshua was teaching, the way of God, the way of living, but just esoteric science, occultism. So none of this is what Yeshua meant by the name of God that we should hallow. In fact, the name of God contains within it many, many names. If we look in the Bible, we find all kinds of different names for God. Uh, this is just a small example uh, of the many, many names there are. And in Judaism, in Kabbalistic Judaism, the names of God are used as focuses for meditation. In Christianity, uh, there are exercises for daily meditations upon the different names of God. In the Jewish mysticism current at the time of Yeshua, the names of God were understood to be emanations or divine attributes of God. They were hypostases or emanations of Godhead manifesting into existence as the worlds are coming into existence. Jewish mysticism goes back to Egyptian uh, theology, for example, the emanation of the nine gods from the original Godhead, each deity being an aspect of Godhead uh, in the original uh, Egyptian Aeneid. We find this in Jew Jewish angelology. The angels and archangels are manifested as coming forth and emanating from Godhead. And originally all the angels were personifications of these things, and they were named with the suffix of El, which means of God. For example, Mikael, the loving kindness of God, Raphael, the healing of God, and so on. In the Kabbalah, the Sephirot became the emanation of the more abstract moral qualities of God. In the Gnostic Pleroma of the Eons, uh, Godhead was manifested in pairs, male-female pairs. And uh, in Hinduism, for example, the deities are manifested as separate named deities. For example, Shiva, who himself has 108 names, or 1,000 names, or 1,008 names. In Islam, there are 99 names of Allah that are used in worship. We could learn what Hashem, the name of God, meant to Yeshua in his time by reading the Sefer Yetzirah and studying it. It's a Kabbalistic oral tradition that existed at the time of Yeshua. Here's a book by Arya Kaplan that I recommend if you want to learn about it. And 
in this mystic tradition that Yeshua would have been steeped in, God emanated himself in stages to create a universe, which later became in Kabbalah, the four worlds. And there were ten vessels, ten containers, ten hearts, that call the sephirot, that were manifested. And they were powers and virtues, wisdom, knowledge, justice, mercy, and so on. These are still referenced in attributions to the seven lights of the Jewish synagogue, which uh, uh, you will find on the altar in a synagogue with seven lights. This seven lights will reference ten sephirot, uh, and this is not to be confused with the, uh, the Hanukkah menorah, which has eight lights. And there are 22 paths that connect these ten sephirot, and that makes 32 names of God. The root attributes of the powers and virtues of God were understood as a kind of tree, like the tree of life. It was the image, or Yetzer Hatov, of God in mankind. As uh, the blind man said, I see men as trees walking. We find a lot of this tree language. In this tree of life are ten sephiro, ten vessels, ten hearts that hold the essence of God's divine ways. And we find all ten of these sephirot, or these attributes of God, in the New Testament, either implied or explicitly uh, spoken of by Jesus in his language. Malkuth, we know, which does not mean kingdom, like the kingdom of God. It means the sovereignty of God. If we go to the Gospel of Thomas, we get what is an authentic Logian, where Yeshua says, the Malkuth of God, the sovereignty of God is spread out upon the earth and men do not see it. God as wisdom, God as justice, God as love and mercy, as forgiveness, as a father and mother. God was understood as hermaphroditic, as bisexual, as a, as a, as a sovereign crown, as a, the victorious one, the one who has knowledge and understanding, the sovereign majesty of God. These are the ten sephirot, and these are the ten root attributes of the name of God, Hashem. In mystic Judaism at the time of Yeshua, there were reverent synonyms used for the name of God and for God. He was called the Head of Days, which correlated with Keter. He was called God the Wise, God the Just, God the Merciful, God the Forgiving, God the Progenitor, the one who is our father, our father-mother. God was understood by the mystics as hermaphroditic, a father-mother. Uh, God the Majestic the victorious, the omniscient, the omnipotent, all of these relating to the Sephirotic characteristics and attributions of Godhead. At the time of Yeshua, Hashem, the holy name, the hallowed name, contained many, many names, many synonyms. The divine attributes were understood as all the virtues or powers of Hashem, the name, in God's image within each person. This is a Kabbalistic representation of yod heh vav -Hey as the spark that is in the soul of each person. This is a representation of the seven spirits with an added eighth in the Testament of Reuben, another literature that was uh, contemporary in the mystic literature of uh, Yeshua's time. Now we have the doxology that we find attached to the Lord's Prayer in the later recensions of Matthew, but not in Luke. It's not original with Yeshua, but it was used by a lot of pious Jews. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. What this really means is thine is the Malkuth, which is the sovereign rulership, the Gevura, which is the just power, and the Tifereth, which is the beautiful glory of God, a very common way of naming God. So to Yeshua, the name of God meant the divine attributes of God in each awakened soul, justice, mercy, forgiveness, and so on. So what did Yeshua mean by hallowed be thy name? Well, the name of God, Hashem, meant the divine way, the halakha taught by Yeshua, the way of walking, the way of living a sanctified life. For Yeshua, his phrase, hallowed be thy name, meant may thy characteristics and virtues and ways of being be valued and manifested in our lives, as in heaven, so on earth. And in Yeshua's discourse, to glorify God did not mean to flatter God. It meant to imitate and show forth God's way. That was the glorification of God, was the glorification of Hashem, his name, which was mercy, justice, and so on. 
And so my simple translation of hallowed be thy name in the Lord's Prayer is, may thy way be hallowed in every heart. So this presentation has introduced just one more aspect of the original Aramaic meaning of the original Aramaic Lord's Prayer. And we'll continue analyzing other parts of it because there are keys in the Lord's Prayer to many of the teachings of Yeshua. So in the next several YouTube videos, we'll do this. As I said, for a $1 patronage, you will receive the PDF file of my book with a more comprehensive analysis entitled Abaun. So please click on the Patreon link in my description just below the video to become a patron helping to sponsor my work. If you have a desktop that you're using, um, you'll be able to click right on the Patreon link on the video, on the YouTube video. Uh, if, you're, if you're looking at this from a mobile device or from a uh, uh, a tablet or something like that, you'll have to go beneath the uh, the YouTube uh, video and look at the link beneath it to to link to the Patreon site. I thank you very much for your support.